Ruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for attending. Again, welcome to our home. Tonight, uh, the uh, the lecture on uh, my thoughts is on the song called The Gambler. So I thought I would play it first and then we'll talk about it a bit. On a warm summer's evening On a train bound for nowhere I met up with a gambler We were both too tired to sleep So we took turns staring out the window at the darkness Till boredom overtook us And he began to speak He said, son, I made my life Out of reading people's faces Knowing what their cards were By the way they held their eyes If you don't mind me saying I can see you're out of aces For a taste of your whiskey I'll give you some advice So I handed him my bottle And he drank down my last swallow Then he boned a cigarette And he asked me for a light And the night got dead quiet and his face lost all expression said you gonna play the game boy you gotta learn to play it right and the chorus you got to know when to hold them know when to fold them know when to walk away I said know when to run Sitting at the table, there'll be time enough for counting when the deal is done. So, this week on my thought, I'd like to examine the words of the chorus of a song that I think teaches us many lessons in life. When I became a Balchuva many years ago, one of the first things that I did was to place my guitar back in its case, and I put it away in my closet. I felt that it really had little or no place in this new lifestyle that I had chosen. After all, most of the music that I played was popular songs with themes that, for the most part, had little, if anything, to do with God and or religion. Well, I was wrong. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson of Blessed Memory, stated that everything, Everything has a godly spark in it, and it becomes our mission in life to elevate anything and everything that we come in contact with. So, based on that statement, I took my guitar out of the closet and I began to use music as a vehicle to elevate me to places that I could never have reached before. Not only did I learn to play Hebrew songs, I found that I was inspired enough to write songs that connected to the prayers that I recited daily a true gift from a benevolent father. The song I'd like to analyze tonight is called The Gambler. It was sung by Kenny Rogers in 1976. It tells the story of a man who was, as the song begins, on a train bound for nowhere. On the train, he met up with a gambler. The gambler, began, being a man with vision, could see that his companion was, so to speak, out of aces a statement that one might say to a person who seems to be out of luck. The gambler tells his young friend some advice about how to play the cards that he has dealt with. He tells him, and as the chorus begins with the words, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, and know when to run. You never count your money when you're sitting at the table. There'll be time enough to count them when the dealing's done. You know, I've many times compared life to a card game. More often than not, we don't choose things in our lives, such as our parents or our siblings, even our peers. We don't choose how we look or how smart we are. All of these are God's choices. 
God puts us into this world with a mission. Our job is to figure out what that mission is and then attempt to fulfill it. We don't have to choose it. We don't get to choose our cards in life. They are dealt to us by God Almighty. We are obligated to play the hand that we are dealt, born with. I see the cards that we are dealt as the personality traits and talents that we are all born with. When you look at a small child, you can already recognize where many of their strengths and weaknesses lie. We don't give our children their personalities, though we can hopefully help in developing them in a positive direction. You know, many times in life, we are like the character depicted in this song, on a train bound for nowhere. We are meandering about in our life, looking for something. The problem that we face is that often we are not quite certain what that something really is. I believe that if we look around closely, we will recognize what it is that we need. You know, we can learn a lesson from the Torah with the story of Hagar. Hagar was the maidservant of Sarah, our mother, and the second wife of Abraham, Avram, our father. The Torah tells us that she runs away from Sarah's house. On the road, she is greeted by four different angels. They instruct her to return to Sarah's house, even if it seemed difficult. The angel assured her that the end would be positive. Now, even when Avram Bino drove her and her son Yishmael out of his home, she was forced to carry Yishmael on her shoulders since he was infirmed. In his feverish condition, he drank up all the water, and she was certain that he would die shortly. She could not bear to watch her son die, so she placed him under a bush, and she walked a distance away. An angel of God approached her and said to her that both she and her son would live. He foretold that her son would father a great nation. The angel then pointed out to her that there was a well nearby where she could draw water to give to her son so that he would survive. The well? The well was there all the time. It was not miraculous. She just didn't look, and so she didn't see. More often than not, God sends his messengers to direct us on our path in life. Everything that we need to succeed is there in front of us. We just need to look. Much like any loving father, God Almighty prepares all that we need for our journey in life. As Helen Keller once said, worse than being blind is to have no vision. So when we are, so to speak, on our train bound for nowhere, we need to know that God has already sent one of his messengers to direct us on the correct path. We just need to be looking out for his message. The chorus begins with the words, you got to know when to fold them, you got to know when to fold them. This, of course, becomes one of the greatest challenges in life, knowing what is good for us and knowing what is not. In the high holiday prayers on Yom Kippur, there are 10 times that we beat our chest and we recite the prayer called the al Khait, which translates as for all the sins that we committed with. This prayer consists of 44 verses, a number which is twice the Hebrew alphabet, which consists of 22 letters. The prayer follows the order of the Hebrew alphabet with a repetition of each letter. So it's Aleph, Aleph, Bez, Bez, etc. Each verse of the prayer describes a particular sin we may have transgressed and for which we thereby ask God for forgiveness. One of the verses in this prayer says, And for all the sins that I committed with my evil inclination. You know, I always find this statement strange. After all, there are 43 other verses in the al Khaits. Aren't all the sins we transgress a result of succumbing to our evil inclination? The answer is no. <laughs> the other 43 verses are for sins which we have committed with our Yetzirah, with our good inclination. We did perform a mitzvah, you see, but we chose to perform the wrong mitzvah. An example of this would be like taking a multiple choice exam. There are five answers to each question. Three of the answers are incorrect. The fourth answer is correct, but the fifth answer huh, is definitively correct. That being the case in this situation, 
The fourth answer is incorrect. It is a sin. We need to know when to hold them and when to fold them. We must focus and choose the correct mitzvah after taking all criteria into account. Everything in life and religion has a pecking order. Doing the wrong mitzvah is also called a sin. You know, it's essential in life that we learn to allow the next words in the chorus of know when to walk away and know when to run in our life. We are constantly being tested. Some of these tests are easier than others. Some really do not present any serious challenge at all. And so we can easily walk away from them. But then, there are those other tests in life that challenge us to our very core. We need to realize that in our own way, each and every one of us is an addict to something. As we cite in the blessing after everything other than bread, cake, or the seven species that Israel is noted for, prayer is rabot, that he, God Almighty, created many souls, people. The chesronon al kolma and everyone is created with an addiction, a challenge. The question that we have to ask is, but why? The answer, the hachayot behem nefesh kol chai, so that we should all be able to live a more vibrant life. Baruch olamim, blessed is he who has created his world. When it comes to the simple everyday obstacles in life, well, we can walk away. But when it comes to facing our addictions, hmm, then we can't walk away. We must run. Even if we think we have conquered our addictions, that they are no longer a problem, we need to know that we are all lion tamers. No matter how good of a show we perform when we enter the lion's cage, we need to always remember that lions are wild and dangerous animals. No matter what they are, they are always lions. You know, years ago I was told an interesting fact about lions. They may appear to be pussycats in the center ring at the circus, but they retain a certain area of independence. If the trainer steps within that area, the lion may well revert back to his true animal nature and attack the trainer. We find this concept stated in Pirkei Avot. Hillel said, do not be sure of yourself until the day that you die. This is the reason the alcoholics that attend AA meetings begin their talk with the statement, my name is so-and-so and I am an alcoholic. Now, it makes no difference how long they've been sober. They always keep front and center in their consciousness that they are an alcoholic. They understand only too well the reality that they are and always will be lion tamers. The chorus ends with the words, you never count your money while you're sitting at the table. There'll be time enough to count it when the dealing's done. As the saying goes, it ain't over until it's over. We read in the Torah that when Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, was about to meet up with his brother Esau on the road, they had not seen each other for 34 years. Yaakov feared that his brother, Esau, might still entertain thoughts of killing him. He was uncertain as to whether he possessed enough merits for God Almighty to save him from his brother, should he intend to cause harm to him or to his family. Imagine that if someone on the spiritual level of Yaakov, our father, was concerned that he may not possess enough merit to be saved from his evil brother, Esau, it should give us reason for concern when we count our money at the table, when we count our many mitzvot, so to speak, during our lifetimes. We may actually believe that we have done pretty well in our lives. After all, as we ascend the mountain of life and as we look behind us, you know, we may well see that the majority of people, what I refer to as the herd, are at the bottom of the mountain. However, what we, what we many times fail to realize is that though we live in a world filled with many people, yet at the same time, we are judged as individuals. Every act that we perform counts. Nothing, nothing is inconsequential. We can, afford, we can never afford to become complacent, so to speak, go to sleep at the wheel. We can never be certain that we have funded our 401k, our spiritual retirement account fully. 
How is a 401k a spiritual retirement account? Well, the Aleph is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet with the gematria, a numerical value of one. And the Tuf is the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet with a numerical value of gematria of 400. 400 plus one, 401. And K is the symbol that is used to indicate that something is kosher. So a 401k represents the mitzvot that we send up to heaven to fund our retirement account in the next world. As I've mentioned before, life is a mountain, and our mission in life is to climb to the top of that mountain. Whether we reach the top of the mountain or not is not what is relevant. As it states in Pirkei Avos, Rib Tarfin states, Lo, alacha hamalacha ligmar, that it is not upon you to complete the work meaning that it is not our responsibility to finish the task, but it is our job to persevere. We do not have the permission to stop, nor do we have the permission to give up. One of the challenges that we as Baal Chuvot face in life is that we stop climbing. You know, we become complacent and we build our mansion on the first or second kind of plateau that we reach. We fail to realize that there is still a great deal of mountain that we can and should climb. We should, so to speak, never count our money while we're sitting at the table. Think that while we are still sitting at the table of life, alive, that we should never feel that we are doing pretty well and that now we can relax. After all, why do we need to climb, keep climbing? There's a story told to Rabbi Levi Yitzhak of Ardichev. He was on his way to the study hall late one night to learn. He noticed that there was a candle burning in the shoemaker's shop. He entered the shop, and there he found the shoemaker. He was busy working on a pair of shoes. Rabbi Levi Yitzchak asked him why he was working so late. And the shoemaker replied, Rabbi, as long as the candle burns, one can still work. Rabbi Levi Yitzchak smiled and nodded his head. Yes, he repeated, as long as our candle burns, as long as we are still alive, we still have work to do. After we leave the table, when we die, then there will be time enough to count our money, our mitzvot, when the dealing is done. When we cash out our chips after we leave this world for our day of judgment in the world to come. The last word that we read in the Torah in reference to the creation of the world is la sot, to do. God Almighty created this world as a place of action. He expects us to be players and not spectators. You know, a spectator can leave the stadium whenever they choose. However, players, players are required to stay on the field until the game is over. It makes no difference what the score is. We need to stay focused. We need to play each hand to the best of our ability. At the same time, we need to hope and pray that when we do leave the table, this world, that we have climbed as high as we could. And with that, I hope that we have seen that we can and learn from everything and everyone in this world. And with that, let us hope to usher in the coming Mashiach Tzikana quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending. And God should bless you all with good, happiness, health, and safety. And again, let me wish you again Shabbat Shalom. Hope you enjoyed the music. <laughs>